Unimaginable tragedy has struck a Florida family. Just a few years after a teen was killed in an apparent accidental shooting, his sister is now dead as well. And her death is still shrouded in mystery. We're discussing what we know so far in the case and what might be happening behind the scenes with Police Sergeant Kyle Schoberg. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. Florida family is once again in mourning after the death of Ava Hewlett. She just turned 19 a few weeks ago, but earlier this month, Ava died at home after a night out with friends. This is so strange. According to an attorney for the family, Ava was hanging out with friends at Pelican Larry's Raw Bar in Fort Myers on June 15th, and apparently she and at least one friend had some sort of medical emergency. So Ava went to the hospital. She was released a few hours later. Her mom took her back to the family home, but by around noon, she found her daughter dead on the bedroom floor. Ava's dad performed CPR, but a medic pronounced Ava dead. The Lee County Sheriff's Department opened up a homicide investigation. They've not named any suspects. They haven't confirmed Ava's cause or manner of death. Autopsy results are still pending. But deputies say they don't have any evidence that restaurant staff is to blame. Now, Anthony Rickman, the Hewlett family attorney, told media outlets, if it is a poisoning circumstance, it's our belief that it was an intentional act by another third party that caused the medical situation for Ava Hewlett. Ava's mother, Megan, wrote in a now-deleted Facebook post that Ava did not take her own life or ingest any dangerous substances knowingly. She even says that her daughter told her at one point during her medical episode that she didn't want to die. And do you remember how I said that the Hewlett family is in mourning again? Well, that's because in 2019, Ava's older brother, James Bradley Hewlett, was shot and killed by a friend. According to police, the 15-year-old was hanging out with friends at one of the boys' homes when they picked the lock of his parents' bedroom and found the gun that belonged to the father, a Tampa police detective. The boys started playing with the gun, this is according to the report, and Bradley was shot and killed. The friend who pulled the trigger was charged with manslaughter. He was given pretrial diversion so that his record could be uh, eventually expunged. The Tampa police officer was disciplined for not properly securing the firearm. And now the family is dealing with the loss of another child. It's heartbreaking to think about this. Megan Hewlett wrote on Facebook in another post, quote, How do you go from the perfect family to completely broken there is not even a glimpse of joy in this family. It's an effing nightmare. Someone wake me up. I will not survive another funeral. I will not survive another cremation. I will not survive another homicide investigation. I cannot survive without my babies. Now, Ava and Bradley apparently had a younger sister as well who's now in high school. It's just our heart, hearts and our prayers go out to this family. It's unimaginable what they're going through. But I do want to get more into the actual investigation here. And for that, let me bring in Kyle Schoberg, a sergeant out of North California, co-instructor of the Patrol Survival Tactics Seminar and host of the Shots Fired uh, podcast. Kyle, good to have you back on. What do you think law enforcement are doing right now behind the scenes? Well, this is a horrible and tragic uh, story. And my condolences also go out to the Hewlett family. This is terrible. Uh, right now, I would suspect that the investigators are waiting for toxicology reports and a um, the coroner report to come back. All of those things take a little bit of time, but an investigation like this, you're going to rely heavily on that, and then you're going to have to go back and comb through. You know, the investigators going to have to go back and comb through video surveillance and you know her get into her cell phone and just kind of walk back her life that day and figure out everything that she was doing, who she was communicating with and see if they can come up with something. But uh, these investigations do take a little bit of time. If they're calling it a homicide investigation, let's be clear on what that means and what that doesn't mean, Kyle. Okay, so they're calling this a homicide investigation because a healthy 19-year-old doesn't just die. So if there's no cause or explanation to her death, they will rule it a homicide until they can prove otherwise. So that's the route that they're taking right now. And again, investigations like this uh, just take a little bit of time to get these actual reports back uh, before they can start diving deeper into it. 
once they get the reports back, how quickly will they alert the media and the public to what's happening? Or if someone was really responsible for what happened to Ava, would we see an arrest before we see uh, the release of uh, those reports? Well, I don't think the agency is going to release a whole lot uh, once they get some of these medical results back because they have to keep the integrity of the investigation close. So they'll get those reports back, hopefully in a timely manner. They'll start their investigation based on that. The problem is that some of these drugs or things that she could have ingested only would stay in her body for up to eight, five, maybe sometimes 12 hours that, you know, like GHB can be tested, uh, which is, we all know, is a common drug that people use to uh, the date rape drug, a drug against women. So those are very hard to test for. That, that has to be done in a timely manner. But once that does come out, I think the agency will probably keep that close and then they will really start their deep dive into the investigation once they get all of that. Can we focus on that aspect a little bit more in the sense that, and yes, I'm speculating right now, but you heard uh, yeah. the lawyer talk about poisoning. In your experience, let's say she had this medical episode, she went to the hospital uh, for a while in the early morning hours and then dies hours later. In your experience, is that consistent with a poison, with a type of poison? Yeah, it would, it would appear to me that that's probably what happened. And when she initially went to the hospital, maybe they didn't suspect that or things weren't communicated properly to medical staff. Who knows? We're speculating on that. Uh, they'll obviously look, look into that. But yeah, I mean, these types of things just sometimes can go undetected. And a lot of the times you're having to go based on what is the patient or the victim's uh, symptoms. And you know, I don't know what she was feeling like. It sounds like her other friend also got sick who also had to be taken to the hospital. So that would lead me to believe that somebody put something either in their drink or caused them both to ingest something that made them sick, uh, ultimately killing Ava. Hey everybody, I just wanna take a quick second to thank Upside for sponsoring this episode of Sidebar. So Upside is a free app that gets you cash back on daily essentials like gas, groceries, dining. Now, believe it or not, I do know how to pump my own gas. I don't know if that was controversial or not, but when I do, I can use the Upside app. Why not get cash back when you fill up your tank, right? And yes, this is actual, real cash back. No confusing rewards or points or credits, just actual money you can transfer straight to your bank account. So once you have the app, claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside, you pay as usual using a debit or credit card and you follow the steps on the app and you get paid. And as you just saw me do, you can use Upside at places like, oh, I don't know, Shell, Exxon, Mobile, 7-Eleven, Sunoco, restaurants like Chipotle, Papa John's, Dairy Queen, Domino's, KFC, Taco Bell. That's just to name a few. Now to find out how much you could earn, click the link in the description to download Upside or scan the QR code on screen and use our promo code SIDEBAR and get an extra 25 cents back on every gallon on your first tank of gas. That's promo code SIDEBAR for an extra 25 cents back on your first gallon of gas. I'm going to uh, complicate this a little bit um, because of course the question is what could have caused Ava and her friend to get sick, right? So we did some digging and we found out that the Fort Myers Pelican Larry's location had apparently closed or temporarily closed down earlier in June after eight violations were noted during a health inspection. So some of the violations were considered intermediate, like dogs being permitted in an outdoor area without a specific ordinance that allowed that. But then there were also what is titled high priority violations, like flying insects in the kitchen area and ready to eat foods that were marked with a date more than seven days after the foods opening the restaurant temporarily closed on june 7th it had a follow-up inspection which they passed um, and while police have said that the restaurant staff is not to blame it is interesting to note that this location had these kinds of issues so assuming this is accurate and we're not casting any blame or aspersions but what would you make of that? Do you think, have you ever seen a case where a restaurant maybe perhaps violated the health code and someone got sick as a result of it, or in this case, uh, potentially died? Do our charges ever brought in those kinds of cases? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, as a cop, especially as a beat cop, you're going into you know restaurants all the time, sometimes after hours during alarm calls. And I've seen some dis pretty disgusting things in, in restaurants. So if that is the case and they have all these violations, I mean, something happened to these girls that, that caused them to be sick. Now, if it was the food or they have, you know, they have all these violations and they're definitely going to go back and look at that. And I'm sure a lot of their food product is going to be tested. 
her autopsy is going to be pretty telling and what was in her stomach. They'll test all that. But I would say that's probably pretty rare that somebody would get food poisoning, you know, from eating at a restaurant uh, t to the point of dying. Um, I, I wouldn't say that that happens very commonly. I would say, though, to answer your question, would they go after the restaurant or the owners of the restaurant? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's negligent. Sure. Um, they will absolutely uh, be held accountable for that. You're talking about, of course, a, a, a lawsuit, a legal case. Um, look, we don't know. We don't know. I, I, we just yeah. saw that the, this restaurant had this. We don't know if it's any way connected to what happened to Ava, but it is something to know that she had this medical episode after being at this restaurant and then she ultimately later dies. So we shall see. Um, and again, no one has been charged or, or, or in connection with this. I want to take it back to the human element for a second, Kyle. As I mentioned, this is a family that has already been suffering. And if you're in this case and you have to talk to this family about the loss of another one of their children or another sister or another sibling, how do you have that conversation with a family who's already lost so much? It is. It's really difficult. It's hard to have a conversation with anybody that's lost anybody, but not alone a child. Uh, now she's lost two two of her children. Look, the hard part too about being an investigator or a police officer is sometimes you know you, you need answers and you have to ask tough questions and it, it's just it's tough. You know, a lot of times we'll bring support with us. We can bring chaplains to help us kind of walk through that. Um, but at the end of the day, we do have to ask hard questions and we need those answers. And sometimes the only people that know those answers are relatives or family members. So it, it's just being as uh, sympathetic and, and having empathy, you know, and just being a human being, you know, take take away the badge and, and what our job title is. I mean, we're also human. And I think just getting to that level and a lot of us have kids of our own, so we can sympathize for, for somebody like that. But that's just what it comes down to is it's it, that's one of the most difficult parts, I think, of this job. And how do you relay, relay information to the family during the course of this investigation? So if it is the autopsy reports, or let's say someone really was behind this and they have a person of interest or a suspect, how much typically does law enforcement tell the family in advance of an action or, or the status of an investigation? So I think you want to tell the family as much as you possibly can. You want to keep them in the loop, right? Sometimes a problem might be if you release information, you just don't know who's going to get here or get a hold of that information. So sometimes if you have to keep things tight lipped, you have to do that for the integrity of the case and then explain that on the back end of the family. But by and large, for these types of investigations, especially involving a 19 year old girl, I mean, the department is going to probably keep the family as much up to date on the investigation as they possibly can. Yeah. Um, but like I said, I mean, sometimes there's just certain things that you got to keep tight, tight lip until you can develop uh, the entire investigation and hopefully come up with some type of suspect or probable cause to make an arrest. Kyle, before I let you go, I want to go back to the other child who lost his life um, because of uh, what is essentially a Tampa police officer not properly securing a gun. That must, I imagine, enrage you when you hear a story like that, right? Yeah, that's uh, pretty disheartening to hear something like that. And then the fact that a, a, a kid was killed because of it, I mean, that's that's terrible. Yeah, and, and it's, it's the word that we use in the law. It's preventable, and it was foreseeable. And uh, we've covered a number of cases like that. You know, the more extreme example could be something like the Crumbly case. But just hearing stories like this, so tragic. And again, I, my heart prayers, best wishes go out to this family. They need it. They need it after the death of yeah. another one of their uh, family members. Absolutely. And you know, it's funny you say, you just mentioned predictable is preventable. I, I literally just posted that on my social media Instagram account today. Predictable is preventable. Yeah. And in case that guy who, you know, didn't properly store his gun, I mean, that is exactly the definition of that. It shouldn't happen. And it happens a lot unfortunately. Uh, Kyle Schoberg, thanks so much for coming on. Appreciate it. And have everybody check out your podcast. You. Where can they find you? Where can they find it? Yeah, head over to our YouTube channel, Shots Fired Podcast. Uh, all first responder law enforcement content on there. And then our Instagram page, Shots Fired Podcast official. We're always updating and putting stuff out there. So I appreciate you having me on, Jesse. It's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure to have you too. And uh, again, thanks so much for the work that you do, Kyle. 
Absolutely. Thank you. All right, everybody. That's all we have for you right now here on Sidebar. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. I'll speak to you next time.